Tough times don't last forever. There is no doubt that we are all tired of the sorrows, pains, and deadness pervading the land. I have good news for you. Christ has come to guarantee true change this April at the Deeper Life National Easter Retreat. It's your time to experience Christ's resurrection power. From Thursday 6 to Monday 10th, April 2023, Join the nearest Deeper Life Retreat location around the globe. Christ's power will be unveiled by Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui and other anointed men of God. Everyone is welcome. The retreat time is a time of waiting before the Lord. I want to plead with you. Be present in every session. The Lord will fill your cup to overflowing. Come um, and taste of Christ's resurrection power. It's real. Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless your name because we're here so we can come to hear your word. And we are praying that you will speak your word to our hearts in a very intimate and personal and practical way today in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that these principles you are teaching us from time to time will be very relevant and practical in every one of our lives that will put everything to practice and therefore live a happy, acceptable life unto you. And eventually when we die, when Jesus comes, we'll be able to reign with the Lord up on high. We we'll pray that you impress these words upon our spirits again today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we are having the concluding lesson from the book of Proverbs. As I explained a fortnight ago, we're going through these various chapters because many of the principles that are there have already been emphasized in the other chapters of Proverbs. I told you before that the book of Proverbs is different from other books, that many of the lessons, instructions there are written in short, short sentences. They're different from the story style or narrative style of most of the other books. And there are many verses that are repeated for emphasis in the book of Proverbs. For study, we'll just go through the major, major lessons and principles so that you'll be able to get a hold on them and make use of them in your life. If you remember, as we have studied the book of Proverbs, I've said a few times that there are ministers, preachers of the Word of God that will make it a practice of reading a chapter a day of the month. And some people have done that regularly because it's referred to as one of the books of wisdom in the collection of scriptures. And so it's very important for us that we'll go through all that we've learned before. And we we'll still try to go through as many times as possible because these words we we'll read will make us very wise. If you look at the outline on your hand very well, you'll see that we have dealt with this outline two weeks ago. I dealt with points one and two, the tongue of the wise, 
and tenderness towards the weak. And then that week I traveled out and I came back last week. And I still consider this very important. And so we're still going to continue with the outline. Now I'm going to handle points three and four, if the time will permit. And then next week, I'll be going to a new part of the series, having eternal consequences within our lives. And so today we're looking majorly at the training. Training of the children, the children in the home, the children in the church and the children of God. And training should be our watch word. Look at Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from age. Here the word of God instructs every parent in every generation, every time. That there is an assignment that is very, very important and essential in our lives. And it should be our priority. Very, very essential. It should top the least in our lives. That if you're a family man, a family woman, you should train up a child in the way he should go. Because when he's old, he will not depart from age. And from the beginning of the Bible to the very end of the Bible, there is a great emphasis, a profitable emphasis, on the training of children in the family. God impressed it, emphasized it, in the hearts of all the children of Israel, that whatever they did, wherever they were, they must emphasize the training of the children in their homes. And God made sure that every Israelitish family will get it to heart that all the children within the family setup must be trained according to the way of the Lord. And here we have, in the center of the Bible, here we have the word of God telling us that every parent should train up every child in the way that child should go, so that when that child is old, he will not depart from age. Why were the children of Israel in particular told about training up their children. You need to understand that amidst the children of Israel, they had the knowledge of the only true God. And let me say this way, they had a monopoly of that knowledge. What that means is this, no other nation, no other group of people knew the God of Israel, the only true God that the children of Israel knew. And therefore there was no other nation that could offer to their children the training they needed to know the way of the Lord. Not only that, all the nations around them, they worshipped idols. They did not know what they ought to do. They did not plan for eternity. They did not know anything about the future. It was only Israel that knew the future because of the revelation of the word of God unto them. It was only Israel that knew the thing that was right because of what God had taught them and therefore the Lord told them, your children will not have the training in any other place. There is only one place where your children will have the training. It is right in your presence. Therefore, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from age. Not only that, there is a devil in the world. And the devil in the world is eager to deceive, eager to destroy. He goes up and down, to and fro, that he may corrupt, that he may deceive, that he may lead astray the people that are living on the face of this earth. And therefore, if those children were not trained, they will go astray. Train up there for a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from age. When a child comes into this world, that child is blank. That child knows nothing. And because of that, the child does not know what is dangerous to him, what is profitable to him, will not know what will benefit his life in the future, and therefore it is necessary that the parents that have come into this world before that child, they will be able to train up the children, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from age. Not only that, every human being that comes into this world has the nature of the devil, the Adamic nature, the sinful nature, the old, corrupt, carnal human nature that normally goes astray. 
Have you ever noticed that anything that you leave to itself, that thing will rot. That thing will be corrupted. That thing will be destroyed. Leave a house for some time. Don't live there. Just build that house. Paint it up. But then do not live there. Eventually you will find that because no human being is living there, taking care of that house, everything will be cracking up. It will collapse. Leave a vehicle for a long time without warming it up, without using it, and just leave it all alone by itself. You'll find eventually that everything will come to pieces. Leave your clothes without wearing it, without cleaning it up. Just leave it alone by itself. You'll find eventually everything will come to rags and to pieces. Leave a little child by itself. Don't train that child. Don't talk to that child. Don't leave that child. Don't ever correct that child. Leave that child like Absalom without any correction, without any guidance, without any leading, without any instruction, without any training. What do you find? That child will become a wayward, a forward, a wicked, a violent individual. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from age. Why did they make such a noise about it among the children of Israel? Why was it their priority, the thing that topped their list, the thing that they did that did not allow anything to hinder them? Here is the reason in Psalm 144 and verse 11. Read me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. David knew from experience in his own home as well as in the nation the presence of wayward children, wicked children, uncontrollable children, children that had been left to themselves when they were young and now they became strange children, strange to their parents, strange to the society, strange in their behavior, strange in the directions of their lives and David knew that if those strange children will multiply in the nation the nation will collapse the family will come down and life will be difficult and therefore he said get rid of these children and deliver us from the hand of strange children their mouths speak vanity their hands walk falsehood why were they to train the children what was the purpose and what was the goal in verse 12 that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. Now, David knew famine because the real work of the Israelites, famine was very, very important. They kept vineyards, they developed crops, and they planted trees, and therefore they knew what it meant for plants to grow up. Before plants would be able to grow up and bear fruit, every Israelite knew that it must be well watered and that you must plant it in a very fruitful soil. And Isaac gives a picture of such a plant. The stones are all gathered away from around that plant. And then the hand of the husband man begins to tend that plant so that the plant will grow. Jesus talked about growing a plant. He said, I am the vine. My father is the husband man. Every plant, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And those that bear fruit, he will purge, he will cleanse, he will cut so that it will bear more fruit. And every Israelite knew before a plant will grow properly, profitably, and bear fruit, you have to cut, you have to cultivate, you have to plant very well, you have to water, you have to take care of that plant. And it says, our sons, if they are going to grow up in their youth, like tender plants, like profitable plants, like fruit-bearing plants, we must cultivate them, train them, bring them up, admonish them, teach them, and train them that our daughters may be as cornerstones, polished after the similitude of a palace. Do you know that there are people that do not put any value on daughters? They do not know that daughters can be of any good at all. They do not think it's necessary to train or to teach or to instruct or to guide or to direct those daughters. But every Israelite knew that God created men and women for a particular purpose. And if those daughters are to be like cornerstones, important in the building, important in the setup, in our language today, important in the civilization, they must be trained, polished, beautified, like the similitude of a palace. And it says, when that is done, 
then the business life of the children of Israel will be what it ought to be. Verse 13, that our garners may be full according to all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. If you are going to prosper in your family, and if you are going to enjoy the work of your hand in old age, train your children. Train up every child in the way he should go, so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. Our parents today are suffering from the lack of training they didn't give us. The nation today is suffering because of the many years ago, 10, 20 years ago, that the children were not trained. Now the school system is collapsing because of the training they did not give to the children and to the teachers when they were much, much younger. If the nation is going to prosper, if every tribe is going to prosper, and if every family is going to prosper, if we're going to enjoy the future, train up a child in the way he should go, so that when he's old, he will not depart from it, and that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in, no going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. You see, when the children are trained, everything will fall into line. Everything will be all right. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Happy is that family. In such a case that will teach and train, instruct and guide, admonish and direct their children when those children were very young. Happy is that people. Happy is that church that will train the children while the children are still very young because the children of today, they are the adult church of tomorrow. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Now, they train their children because, one, it will give them a happier life in the future. It will give them a happy business life in the future. Not only that, it made them to understand that God will be committed to fulfilling the promises he has made to them. Here is what God told Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. They knew because of their father Abraham, because of what God testified about their father Abraham, that if they trained their children, they were preparing themselves, they were paving the way for the fulfillment of the promises of God in their lives. God said about Abraham, I know him. Can God say that about you as a parent, as a father? Can God say that about you as a parent, as a mother? For I know him. God knew this. Now let us understand, whatever you do, whatever your life may be, Whatever else you may be doing in the nation or in the church, if you are neglecting the training of your children, God knows something about you that makes him unhappy. Think about it. Whatever you achieve, whatever you do, whatever money you have, whatever popularity you have, whatever station or status in life you may have, if you neglect the training and the teaching of your children, God knows something about you that makes him unhappy. You may go all over the world and do something and say you want to make a name. If you neglect the training of your children, there are some promises of the word of God that will never be fulfilled in your life. Listen to me. God emphasizes training to the point that he says, if you are not training your children, if you are not teaching your children, there are some precious promises that will never fulfill in your life. The greatest promises made to Abraham, the most spectacular promises made unto Abraham, and those things were based on training and teaching his own children and household after him. And God said, I know you. In fact, listen to me. God said, shall I hide anything from Abraham? What I will do? Will I hide it away from him? Will I not make this great revelation unto Abraham? Knowing this, that he will train, he will command his own children. There are some revelations we'll never get from the Lord. God will just turn his back on you, turn his face from you, if you are not training your children. He says, I can talk to you because God is the father of all spirits. And he gives us the example because he teaches us, he trains us, he directs us, he counsels us, he corrects us, he leads us in the right way. And he expects that if we really love him, we'll follow his example, we'll train our children. I mean, your child at home, you'll train that child. And if you're not like God, if you are so different from the Almighty God, from the Father, and He says, I know this, He's different from me. 
He never talks to his children. He never corrects his children. He never trains his children. The lives of those children are not important to him. He loves money more than the fruit of his own womb, of, his, of our womb. He loves money more than the people that he has brought into this world. He doesn't count the lives of those children precious at all. He loves all the outdoor activities. Outdoor activities, social activities, more than the training of his children. God will not make his revelations unto such a man, unto such a woman, for I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord. That's what we are training the children for, that they will keep the way of the Lord. Now, if you are going to teach your children to keep the way of the Lord, it's assumed that you know the way of the Lord yourself and to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. That's why the children of Israel taught and trained their children. They understood that except they did it, except they did it, the favor of the Lord, the fellowship of the Lord will not be abundant upon them. Are you a young mother? Train your children. Are you a young father? Train your children. Are those children already growing up? You say, those children are already hard, stubborn. Because I didn't train them many, many years ago, if they are still under your roof, go and pray and repent. And say, Lord, I left my duty many years ago, but I'm turning, I'm repenting. Now if you hear this and you say, well, it's already past now, I cannot do anything for those children anymore. Then there is no repentance. But when you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I neglected my duty, young mothers. I neglected my duty, young fathers. And I neglected my duty, old fathers and mothers. But Lord, today I'm repenting. I will begin to train every child you have given me. Not only just giving them clothes, that's good. Not only just giving them food, that's good. But training them. Put, making an impact in their lives. Writing on the clean, empty slate of their heart the word of godly living that will make their lives prosperous and profitable in the future. Look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and from verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up you know the condition is that first of all the word must be in your heart it must be in your life it must guide you completely because god wants us to start with to leave a perfect example before our children you are the light for your children like father, like sons, like mother, like daughters. You'll never bring your child above the level of your, own le of your own living. If you live a wicked life, no matter what you teach, no matter what you instruct those children, they're going to follow your example. I hear your word, but I see your example more. And your example is so loud that your word becomes meaningless unto me. That's what the children are saying. That what you do has more weight. How you act as more wage. The places you go uh, shows the example to the children. And therefore the Lord said, if you are going to train and teach those children, let the word of God first of all be in your heart. Implant it in your heart. Lay by it. Let your light so shine before your children that your children will see your good works and they will glorify the heavenly father who is your own father. Let your light so shine. That your children will be able to see that your life is an explanation, an amplification, an interpretation of the word you are teaching them. You be salt in your family. Ye are the salt of the earth. But first of all, the salt in your family. The salt in your household. The salt among your children. So that your children will see that your life is salty. Your, light, your life is bright. And therefore, they are able to follow. And then you teach the children diligently. What does that mean? Teaching the children diligently. If you teach the children without any plan, haphazardly, without having any mind on it, the children are not on your timetable, the children are not important to you. 
and you only once in a while beat them when they do wrong, that's not training. But in an organized manner, well-organized manner, well-planned manner, something that is on your heart, something that's the priority in your life, that you teach the children diligently by instruction. You teach the children diligently by example. You teach the children diligently by correction. And it says that you talk of them, of the word of God, of the principles of godly living. When thou sittest in thine house, as you are sitting down in the house, you don't joke with sin. You don't joke with immorality. You don't do anything with that child that will contradict the training and the teaching you are giving to the child. And it says you talk of the principles of godly living in the house. And when you are walking with the child, and when you are lying down with the child, and when you are rising up with the child, you will bind them for a sign upon thine hand, that, thou, that they shall be frontless between thine eyes. Those children will learn by what they see. If you are teaching about church going, about Bible reading, about praying to God, about doing good to your neighbor, about serving the only true God, about worshiping the God of heaven, about calling on the name of Jesus, but at the same time, all over your sitting room, there are pictures of masquerades. You say they are calendar. You say you got it from your office. But then, all that you are teaching them, you teach them about God, they see the picture of masquerades. You teach them about the Almighty God, they see the picture of idols. You see, what you are teaching must go along with the pictures you hang in your room. Must go along with the pictures you hang in the sitting room. So that what they see and what they hear will go all together. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy door and of thy gates. Out of sight is out of mind. And if you make all those things to remain in their sight, in their presence all the time, it will be helping them. It will be teaching them. If they have separate room to themselves, get the pictures of people who pray. The picture of Jesus Christ. And then the wordings of the Bible. As soon as they begin to know how to read, let them have the words that will be challenging. The words that will mold their lives in their formative years. And so it says, let's come back to Proverbs chapter 22 again, verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from age. Now we have seen that before we can train a child, we should know the word of God ourselves and live by the word of God. Because if we are not living by it, we cannot even teach it effectively. I am talking to parents now at home. That for the sake of our children, let us live by the word of God. Let them see the relationship between father and mother, daddy and mommy. Let them see that the relationship is built upon the word of God so that your children are not saying, our parents are saying, do as we say, not as we do. Therefore, let them see it in your character. Let them see it in your behavior. Right from early childhood, let them know that their parents love the Lord. They love the word of God. They are planning their lives and organizing their lives according to the unchanging, infallible word of Almighty God. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old... He shall not depart from age. But we know that sometimes, even when you are teaching the children, sometimes they will go astray while you are still training them. Sometimes they will misbehave. Why? Well, because of the carnal nature in them. Because of the forgetfulness in their nature. Because of the waywardness in their nature. Because there, is temptations from the, there are temptations from the devil. Because of examples of other little children at school that they have seen. Sometimes they become rebellious. What do you do? Well, the Bible tells you what to do. It says you should chastise them. You should beat them. But listen to this. You never beat a child before you give that child instruction. Where there is no law, there is no sin. You may know the sin to be wrong. That child does not know that that sin is wrong. And if you have not first of all given instruction, explanation, if you have not first of all given the word of God over and over, line upon line, precept upon precept, if that child goes astray, you cannot beat that child. That will be wrong. Where there is no law, there is no sin. The child doesn't know anything. But it is after you have taught the child, you have laid the example before the child, you have emphasized it to the child, you have repeated it before the child, if the child goes wrong, 
and you know this is deliberate this is not a mistake then you have to rebuke that child proverbs chapter 19 and i'm reading verse 18. chasing thy son chastise thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying of course when you beat the child the child will cry but do not allow yourself to be so sympathetic and to be so tender that you cannot be the child because the child will cry. Do your duty even though the child is crying. Explain to the child what the child has done wrong. Remind the child what you taught the child before. Tell the child, if I leave it to yourself and you continue doing like this, you will become a wayward child. Tell the child, if I leave you to yourself and I do not beat you and chastise you, eventually you might become a violent, wicked person. You'll go to prison. Your life will not be led to the joy and the happiness of yourself and the family. That's why you are beating that child. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Do not give excuse for the child and say, well, it's only a child. If you have taught that child and the child is not going the way you are teaching, chastise, beat the child, so that the child will be corrected. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and thou shalt deliver his soul from hell. We need to understand that passage very well. Let us understand that there is a type of beating that can destroy a child in the physical, in the emotional, in the spiritual. Let's consider this, the physical. You are beating a child and you beat that child carelessly as if you were fighting with the child. Correction is not fighting. That child does not have your strength. That child does not have your ability. That child is still very tender. And you do not beat a little child like you beat an adult. Because you are not fighting. You are correcting that child. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. That is, you are not beating the child to kill the child. Do you understand that if you strike the eye of the child, and that child goes blind in that eye, there may never be a replacement. You may deform that child for life. You know the fingers don't have a replacement. If you beat the child to the point that you break the bones, you may cripple that hand for life. You are correcting, you are not destroying. And so withhold not correction from the child. Let it be only correction. Don't beat in anger. Don't beat as if you are revenging on that, on that child. You have sent the child to do something and the child has not done it. You are not revenging on the child. You are not retaliating on the child. You are not trying to beat that child so that the next time when I send you to do something, you will do it for me. Don't you know who I am? That's not why you are beating the child. You are training that child. You are correcting that child. Therefore, be very careful. Another thing is that the emotional aspect of the child. The child will know whether you are angry or not. And if you are angry, and if you are bitter, the mother has done something with, that you didn't appreciate. And now the child did something. And while you are beating the child, you said that you are the child of your mother, rebellious as your mother. The child knows that you are not only beating him to correct him, you are beating him so that you can punish him for the mother and punish him for himself. That child will be emotionally disturbed. That's no correction. You are bitter. And you are trying to revenge on that child what the mother has done against you. That's no correction. That's malice. That's bitterness. That's something injurious. It will destroy that child spiritually. When you beat a child for something that he is doing, and yet you do not point that child to the grace of God, to the love of God, and to the change that Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus can make in the life of that child. And you just beat that child and you say, you must make all the correction. He says, I've tried. You must try again. And you do not tell that child, well, if you pray, God will change you. I still have to beat you because I'm correcting you. But you may not have the ability yourself. It is by grace. It is by faith. You go to the Lord. Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. So as to remove all these blemishes away from your life, my child. And when you tell the child like that, you are correcting that child moderately. 
You are correcting that child and you are not disturbing that child emotionally. You are correcting that child and you are leading that child to the source of strength that will make that child to be able to live right. Look at those verses again. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and he shall de and shall deliver his soul from hell. Look at chapter twenty, chapter twenty-seven, verse five. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. When you correct your child, correct openly. You are not correcting child A. By talking to child B, saying, Do you know that your brother is not doing well? That's no correction to the one that is not doing well. Call the person that is not doing well, your child that is not doing well, and give an open rebuke, open correction. My child, I don't want this. I don't like this. This is not according to the word of God. This will ruin your life. Talk to your child directly. Are you afraid of that child? Or are you going to talk to other children on behalf of the single child? Talk to that child. And let that child know that you have an open rebuke for him. Chapter 28. And verse 23. He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. Still telling us the same thing. Rebuke that child, correct that child. And then, chapter 29, verse 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, and he shall give delight to thy soul. Verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. I told you before in this study that if you leave a car to itself, to come, to, come apart, you leave a house by itself, it will crack up and be destroyed. You leave a plant to itself. You find that the snares and all the birds will pick the fruits away. Everything will be destroyed. You leave a child to himself. That child is destroyed. He will come to shame and bring the parents to shame. I've been talking to the parents. Let me talk to the children. Now when the parents correct us, what do we do? How do we react? In Lamentation chapter 3. Lamentation chapter 3. Verse 27. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. A young man, your, your parents will correct you. Your mother will rebuke you. Your father may beat you. And sometimes it is not easy. That's a great yoke. And it is good for a young man. It's good for a young woman. It's good for a boy. It's good for a girl to bear the yoke in his youth. You mark this, this word I'm telling you. And see all those children, every time that the parents correct them, they run away from home, they sleep outside. Those children will never come to maturity. Those children will never make anything good in life. Every time they are corrected, they run out, they sleep outside, they'll never make anything good in life. But you see, the children that will bear the yoke, the children that will stay under that correction and understand the correction of my father, the correction of my mother is for my good, is for my training, is that I may follow the way of the Lord, I may follow the profitable way, so that in life I will not be destroyed. Those are the children that will make it through in life. Let's come back to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from age. Here we have an instruction given to parents at home, but at the same time, is given to the church of God. In our own church here, we have many children. Some of those children are our own children. Some of those children are just creatures of God. Their parents do not come to this church. And God has given us an instruction. A commandment and it says train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he, shall, he will not depart from age let me tell you this no matter what we do in this church no matter what we spend on our missionary work no matter what we spend on all the adult activities if we do not train the children in the church we are omitting a, a very major commandment of the Bible we're not pleasing God 
We're not totally following God. If this church will neglect the training and the teaching, the instruction and the guidance of the children, the children in the church, we're not following the Lord. Have you noticed what we have done? That many times we neglect the children. It appears we're not reading our Bibles aright. We do not have enough teachers in the children's church because the adults, all they want is to evangelize the adults. Do you know there are millions of children all over Nigeria? And in this city alone, there are thousands of children. And the children that come to this church will have thousands, thousands, thousands of them in every service. They come on Monday, they come on Thursday, and they come on Sunday. And yet, when we call on parents to volunteer so that those children in the children's church will be trained, will be directed, they are not interested because of the noise of the children, because of the running up and down of the children, because of the activity of the children, because of the waywardness of the children, because of the difficulty with familiar spirits that some of the children have got involved with, instead of training those children, the, the people here, they avoid them. And we've been calling every time, crying every time, that the children's church, we need more workers. We need parents that will go and teach them. We, we need mothers that will go and teach them. We need nurses that will go and train them. We need even men that will go and train them. But we are all running back. But you see, I cannot leave what I'm doing now and then go to the children. The adult church will be neglected. When you come in here on Thursday, I cannot leave the adult revival hour and then go to the children revival hour. Some of you that have been drinking in the word, eating the word, receiving the word for many, many years, you are, you are equipped and competent now to be able to help us go to the children's section and train them. Otherwise, this church will be guilty. We'll be guilty of the blood of those children. We'll be guilty of neglecting the future generation of this nation. Therefore, this church has a challenge. Therefore, this church has a commandment we have neglected. Therefore, this church has an assignment we have not done very well. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. We need to train the children that are coming to the church on how to be born again. We need to teach the children that are coming to the church how to live the Christian life. And when they fall, pick them up. When they make mistakes, correct them. Correct them in love. Let them know that we in the adult church, we love them. And we understand they are the adult church of tomorrow. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. How do we train those children? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to all, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In the home, that's what you do for your children. In the church, that's what we do for the children. It says that we should bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Give them the knowledge of the Lord. What does it mean? Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so again, we need to understand that children in the church must be taught. We have children too, young people, teenagers in the secondary school. And we need to train them, we need to teach them. And we do not have enough workers that will care for those students in the second, at the secondary school level. They need concentration, they need a lot of attention, they need a lot of the teaching that we receive in the church. And we need people that will be burdened, people that will see the vision, People that will understand that the millions of children in this nation, they need to be taught the word of God. Their parents are neglecting them. And we have the word of God that will make their life to be conformable to the word of God. And therefore, we should come out and we should volunteer ourselves so that we start with the church. Then we go to the DLSO, the Deeper Life Schools Outreach, and be able to help all those children once again. Remember, the assignment, the priority before the church Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from age. But then you remember this. That I told you over and over. That all of us in the church were like children in the hands of God. When you become born again, you know nothing of Christian teaching. 
When you became born again, did you know anything? Did you know any passage of the Bible on how to overcome temptation? How to keep your relationship with God? Did you know how to become holy, perfect, matured in the Lord? When you became born again, did you know, did you understand the interpretations of different parts of the Bible? When you became born again, did you know much about the second coming of the Lord, about the great tribulation, about the Antichrist? Did you know about the millennial reign? Did you know the passages about the eternal, the eternal God, about the Holy Trinity? Did you know anything about heaven, about hell? When you became born again, you were like little children. When you became born again. And as little babes, the Lord commanded, you begin to desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow. But not only that, the Lord has given you a father in the church. And he has given you many senior brothers and senior sisters in the church. Many leaders in the church. What's the responsibility of your father in the Lord, of the pastor, over all of you who are children in the hand of God? Here it is. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. That has been the concern of the pastor in the church, of your father in the Lord. As a child in my hand, I understand that you do not know spiritual things, except you are taught. And that is why we make all this available every Sunday, every Monday, every Thursday, and for the workers, every Saturday. And we're trying to train you up in the way you should go. So that when you become older, you will not depart from the way of the Lord. But just like little children, we have a corrupted world around us. Sometimes we have the misleading examples of other people around us as well. Sometimes because Satan is going up and down, to and fro, seeking whom he may devour and deceive. Sometimes we are deceived. And sometimes what you have been taught in the church, you have not been able to follow. What should I do as your father, as your parent in the Lord, as the one that is training you, wanting you to become excellent in the way that you live? What should I do when you go astray? What I should do is what we do for children. Look at Proverbs again, chapter 19 and verse 18. Chasing thy son when there is hope, let not thy soul spare for his crying. You know what that means? It means that when you as a son in the church, as a daughter in the church, when you go wrong, then your father in the Lord will chastise you. Now, actually, it is God himself, the God of heaven, who is our ultimate father, the father of all flesh and the father of all spirit, and the father of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is he that is chastising us. But let me ask you, how does God chastise his own children? How does God correct? How does God rebuke? When God rebuked people in the Old Testament, people in the New Testament, how did he rebuke them? Do you remember when God rebuked Pharaoh? He sent Moses unto him. He said his heart is hard, his heart is hard, his heart is hardened. But Moses go to him and tell him that if he does not do my will, this is what I will do unto him. And then when he did not obey, whom did God use to bring the correction and chastisement upon Pharaoh? He used Moses with, his, with the rod in his hand. And the rod in his hand was not only to bring miracle before them, it was to chastise them. And when it pained them, Pharaoh called them because of the chastisement of that rod and said, Now I will let the children of Israel go. Let me remind you, when Miriam and Aaron did something wrong, how were they chastised? God called Moses and said, call them to the tabernacle. And when the glory of the Lord departed, leprosy came upon Miriam. That was chastisement. That was saying, Miriam, you've gone astray. You have not followed the teaching and instruction. Now this is what will happen. When Saul disobeyed the Lord, how did God chastise him? He sent Samuel unto him and said, go and tell Saul that I've rejected him. He has not walked in the way of the Lord. And when and Ahijah, when they went against the word of the Lord, all those people in the, Old, in the Old Testament, God sent Elijah, go and tell him, is it because there is no God in Israel that you have sent to the God of the Echons, because of that you are not coming out of that bed, that you are lying down sick. God sent the prophets that he has chosen, the servants that he has chosen in the New Testament. Isn't it the same way? That God will send his own, his own prophet, his own servant, the apostle, or the pastor, or the teacher. And he will rebuke you, and he will correct you. Look at First Timothy chapter 5. And in verse 20. 
them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. You see, that's the word of the Lord. When somebody has sinned, when somebody has gone wrong, you have been taught the word of God, the doctrines of the Bible, and you go astray. We'll treat you like a child, we'll treat you like a son, like a daughter in the church, in the family, in the family of God. We'll rebuke you before all, that others may fear. What should be your attitude? Just what I read to you before in Lamentation, chapter 3, verse 27. It is good that a man, young man, old man, it is good that a woman, young woman, old woman, bear the yoke in his youth, in her youth. And then look at Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. All the, chil all the children of God, all the Hebrew Christians, now it says, as unto children. You are a child in the hand of God. You are a child in the church of God. And do not come to the position where you are fatherless, where you are an orphan, where there is no correction, where you do not regard the word of God or the word of man. Like the unjust man, the unjust judge that regarded neither God nor man. Do not come to the position where there is no correction. It says that ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, and faint not when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, and beateth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he, whom the father chasteneth not? When you do wrong, go before the Lord and say, Lord, I have offended. I've done something wrong. The chastisement you have sent through your son, through your servant, through the pastor, I accept it as the love of God for me. Who doesn't want me to go astray? You do not want to be like Absalom, that the father never corrected. He ruined himself. He ruined the kingdom. You do not want to be like a person that is left to himself. A child left to himself will be shame unto the mother, shame unto the father, shame unto the church. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Mark that in your Bible. All are partakers. That means in the life of the church, how can you be in the church for 10 years and there's no correction any time? How can that be? How can that be? How can a child be in a home? For 10 years, and from the first day that child had been born to the end of 10 years, no single correction at that time. How can that be? And if you are a child of God, if you are a member of the family of God, how can it be that you have been without chastisement? Wherefore, all, whereof all are partakers? If it is like that, if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. We are sons, that's why we are corrected. We're children of God, that's why we are corrected. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, respect, and honor. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening be up for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. It's not convenient to the flesh. When you beat a little child, that's not convenient for the flesh. When you correct a member of the church, that's not convenient for the flesh. The human mind will want to resist. The, the pride in the heart that is hidden there, that you didn't know there was any pride there in your heart before. But when you are corrected and chastened, the pride in the heart will raise up its ugly head. But it is your duty to beat it down, to subject and say, No, I'm going to abide by the chastening of the Lord that is sent through his own servant. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. And so in the church, God has so arranged it that God will correct us through his own servants. And not the pastor alone. There are times that a zona leader will know something in the zone. Now what do you want the zona leader to do? To pet you? When you have done something wrong, he will correct you. And if you look at his age and you say, how can this zona leader correct me like this? He's younger than myself, that's alright. He's younger than yourself, but God has put him there as your father there in the zone. 
And sometimes there's a coordinator that the case has become so serious that your case must go beyond the zona leader to the coordinator. And of course, the co coordinator is not going to be laughing when you've done something wrong. He's going to correct you. And if you look down him, how old is he? When did he become a coordinator? If you do that, you are not respecting the Lord. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading there in verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourself. Obey them. That's the plural. Obey them. Not only the pastor, but the other leaders that we have at different levels of leadership in the church. Obey them that have the rule over you. And it says, submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. That's what we're doing. We're watching over your soul. Watching after your, after your soul. After your spiritual welfare. And it says, as they that must give account, we're going to give account for your life. We're going to give account for your development. We're going to give account for your maturity. And it says, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. We thank the Lord because he has given us a church like this, where you can be corrected when you go wrong. And maybe in your life you have found that you have not been responding well to correction. You have been against it. You have been gossiping about it. You have been negative to it. What should you do now? Let's come to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 4. Will thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? That means, will you not come to the Lord now and repent and say, Lord, I've been mistaken. I thought that correction was to destroy me. I thought that training was to maybe attack my personality. But now, Lord, I know I've been wrong. You have been trying to chastise me. You have been trying to correct me. You have sent your Moses, you have sent your Elijah, you have sent your David, you have sent your Paul, you have sent your Peter, you have sent the pastor, you have sent the leaders in the church to correct me. But I've been resisting. I didn't know that this was your hand. But now I know you are dealing with me as a son. I will bear the correction. I will correct my life. I will turn my life under the blood of Jesus Christ and receive the abundant grace of the Lord that I may be obedient to the word of the Lord. Will you not at this time from now on cry unto the Lord, My Father, thou art the guide of my youth. You are training me, you are teaching me, you are guiding me, you are instructing me. I will never go, with, I will never go without your chastisement or instructions anymore. Lord, chastise me more, correct me more, direct me more. Send those leaders in the church, and if there is anything in my life, help me that everything may be corrected. I went astray before, but now your correcting hand, your guiding hand, has brought me back to the path of rectitude and righteousness again. Let's rise up and tell the Lord that will accept correction, and we who are parents will guide our children at home, correct our children at home, train our children at home. Really open your heart to the Lord. We need correction. Our children need correction. The children in the church, they need training. Let's pray to the Lord. He will help us to train our children aright. Young parents, are you training your children? Are you neglecting your children? Or have you left the training of your children to your neighbors? To little girls and little boys that you have at home who are not born again? Train your children at home. Teach them the word of God. Direct your children in the way they ought to go. Let it be well organized, well planned training for your children. Your children are precious. Train them. Devil is trying to snatch them away from you. Train them. Those children are ignorant. Train them. When they go wrong, chastise them. Beat them, but moderately. And you children, come under the yoke. Come under the correction. Don't run away from home because you are being corrected. Be grateful to God for a godly father. Be grateful to God for a godly mother. Train up a child in the way he should go. 
When he is old, he will not depart from it. Train your children. Don't let their complaints and crying stop them from stop you from training them. Teach and train them. Obey the commandments of the Lord, no matter what that child is feeling about it. Remember, you are a child also in the church. You have a pastor, you have a father. Sometimes they'll rebuke you, chastise you, correct you, train you, and guide you. Be obedient. Correction may not be something joyous, be grievous to the flesh. Accept it from the Lord. When the leaders in the zone, the leader in the district, when he corrects you, chastises you, rebukes you, receive it as from the Lord. Rather than murmuring and grumbling and complaining, if you accept correction, then you are a real child. Then you are a real son, you are a real daughter. Tell the Lord to give you grace. If you feel you've gone astray, if you are convicted you've gone astray, tell the Lord to wash you clean with the blood of Jesus Christ and set your feet in the right direction.